Good evening and welcome to tonight's candidate forum for Mount Diablo Unified School District Governing Board Member oh. Area 3. My Can name is Liz Fuller, Library Services Manager for the Contra Costa County Library. Tonight's event is a partnership with several organizations, the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, the County Elections Department, and CCTV. We're streaming live on Facebook and video coverage will be available online after the program on the library now? and County Elections Department websites, as well as the League's Voters Edge website. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this evening, Gail Saxton from the League of Women Voters. Gail is a former Can labor- Can you hear me? Employee. Yes, Gail. That's her. <laughs> employee relations executive who retired after 40 years of overseeing contract negotiation and administration for three top universities. <sighs> Welcome, Gail. You're up for uh, the forum. Welcome from the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. My name is Gail Staxton, and I am your moderator. Timers are Peggy Houston and Marielle Fortz. I'd like to welcome you to this forum, which is held to inform you about the candidates running for the trustee of the Mount Diablo Valley Unified School District, Area 3. Candidates participating in today's forum are Keisha uh, Mizewitz and Michael Schneider. Candidates not participating in today's forum are Dennis Chow. Today's purpose is voter education. The League is a nonpartisan organization, meaning we never take positions on candidates or political parties. However, we do take positions on some issues. As a moderator, I neither live nor vote in this area. This session will follow a standard League format in order to best provide the fairness of a level playing field. Before the session began, the names of each candidate were selected at random to determine opening speaking order. Closing statements will be in the reverse order. Opening and closing statements are two minutes each. After opening statements, we'll proceed to questions and answer segment of the program, in which I'll ask the candidates questions submitted by the audience. Each candidate will have the opportunity to answer each question. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the question, personal attacks, not permitted, and statements made about other candidates must be in the public record. If one candidate references the other candidate, the candidate referenced will have an opportunity to respond. Okay, now let's uh, begin with the opening statements. We begin with candidate Michael Schneider. Michael? Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Schneider. I'm a 20 year resident of Mount Diablo Unified School District and the past seven years in the Monument area or Four Corners in Concord, next to La Clinica and Rick Sears Park. I have a child who will be attending Oak Grove Middle School and Ignacio Valley High School where I coach their tennis team. I am a Bay Area native born in Hayward, California. I'm a graduate of the Richmond, former Richmond Unified School District and have attended both Contra Costa and DVC College. As a 10-year Concord business owner and technologist, I lead a team of 11 employees who are responsible for monitoring and processing almost $1.6 billion in real estate transactions each and every year. I am running for school board because I've earned the trust and support of my neighbors, parents, and residents of Concord. I've spoken at multiple Concord City Council meetings and school board meetings for years regarding safety and equity issues within the city of Concord, our schools, and the Monument neighborhood. My communications network of over a thousand stakeholders via social media platforms with Concord nonprofit partnerships have allowed me to engage with multiple demographics regarding community and educational issues that affect our daily lives in area three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we will hear from candidate Keisha Mazewitz. Keisha. Thank you, good evening. My name is Keisha Nzewi. I was born and raised in Hanford, California and I've spent all but one year of my adult life living in the East Bay. I earned a bachelor's of social welfare from the University of California, Berkeley and a Master of Public Health from San Francisco State University. I began my career as a VISTA volunteer in Sacramento as a community organizer, and I continued working for a few more years as a community organizer in South Hayward, Ashland, and Cherryland communities before my focus 
switch to policy advocacy. I'm currently the public policy director for the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network, where I work on state, federal budget, legislative, and administrative advocacy. All of these things make me well qualified to seek the office of school board trustee. But what I think qualifies me the most is that I'm a parent with a child in the district going through the same ups and downs as most everyone else. I understand the frustrations parents go through when there's poor communication or when parents, when teachers and programs are on the chopping block each year. Like all parents, I want the best schools and the best educational experience as possible for my child. But in fact, I want that for all children. We need decision makers who aren't confined in their thinking to the way things are or the way things that or the way things have always been, but are willing to identify the things that don't work, have the courage to start over and rebuild it the right way. If we do nothing, nothing changes. I'm ready to do something and I'm ready to do those hard things. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're moving on to the question and answer portion. Remember, you have one minute to answer each of these questions. This time we're going to start with Keisha. Um, we are going to rotate um, through these questions with each candidate being, different candidates being asked to start. So Keisha, how will you, your being on the school board as a trustee improve the efforts of the district to meet its various goals? I think that um, in, in the short term, this district has a lot of huge challenges before it. Distance learning and an impending huge budget deficit. I think how the district will benefit having me on this board, having to address those tough issues, is that, as I just said, I'm willing to look outside of the box. I'm willing to think creatively. I'm also um, a great communicator, and I'm proactively reaching out to all constituencies to learn and understand their needs, wants, and desires so that we can work through, um, in partnership, these really, through these difficult times. Um, I think that, especially when it comes to budgeting, we have to have everything on the table have a clear view of what 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 our budget what our district spends money on and how they spend money and work together to make it as least um, harmful to children parents families staff teachers as possible and I'm, I'm able and willing to do that Thanks. thank you Michael how will your being on the school board as a trustee improve the efforts of the district to meet its various goals Thank you. From a short-term perspective with the district's learning and everything, I actually was a key member of, for the real estate industry as far as bringing technology um, and bringing a, a very archaic paper process into the 21st century, both here locally and nationally. So by going ahead and start addressing some of the technology issues that we are so far behind, we can start moving forward and creating a more easy flow that would give us a better opportunity of giving options to parents as we go through not only this, but also future um, natural disasters or bad air days. At the same time, um, we have not tapped into almost 50 million in funding from our partnerships with Concord, California, and we definitely need to do that in order to go ahead and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael, we're going to start with you. Uh, the second question, if you are elected, share if and how you will transition from the I as a candidate to the we as a governance team with the trustees and the superintendent. Thank you. As a we teamwork, I've always, always, my business models have always been about partnerships. Nothing works um, without having partnerships that are in agreement with each other. Um, I don't like the term of out of the box because that usually ensues that you're going to intrude on somebody else's business model or, um, or other uh, entity. So by going ahead and having my existing network, which is already a we, as in we the people in area three, it's already been up and running. It has been voiced over and over again at the board over these last few years with no movement, including that of crossing guards for the city of Concord, um, which has had 
44 children in the last four years struck by motorized vehicles. We need a voice of we on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha, same mm -hmm. question. If you are elected, Chair, if you will transition from the I as a candidate to the we as a governance team with the trustees and superintendent. I think um, working in partnership on a governing board of five, you can't even you can't even come in there as as an I, and I haven't been an I from the first day of my campaign. Um, I have the backing and support of so many community members, parents, teachers, um, an am amazing diverse array of people who are really um, helping me learn, helping me understand um, the needs of the community, the needs of our school district, of our parents and our teachers. I would step in on day one as a we. Um, one, looking to learn from the more um, experienced trustees who have been on the board for a while, but also offering what to the team what I have to offer, what I know and how I work um, and what I've learned from the community. I think that this area trustee transition is giving us the opportunity to focus on one specific community. And so there's there will be a strong voice to spread throughout the whole board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Keisha, again, uh, we'll take first the next question. It has been said that a primary goal of education is to help students learn uh, what they love to do. Your thoughts based on your own personal experience with this in mind? I act, I, my hope, my hope, my own hope for my, my own child is that she grows up and gets to do not only what she's good at, but what, the, but what she loves doing. We should all be so lucky. And I think education has the potential to allow kids to grow up to do what they love to do, but only if they are exposed to an array of things. Um, <laughs> wow, we expose them to their ABCs and one, two, threes. We should definitely be exposing them to the arts and to athletics and to technology and to the trades because there's so much out there and they won't know what they're good at and what they enjoy unless they're exposed. And I think education is absolutely the right place to do that. And in school from K through 12, um, kids can yeah start their future right and, and know and understand who they are and, and what they enjoy doing. Thank you. Uh, Michael, same question. It's been said that a primary goal of education is to help students learn what they love to do. Uh, can you please provide your thoughts based on your own personal experience with this in mind? I agree more. And this is one reason why, even at the age of 18, as I volunteered at the local boys club, tutoring disadvantaged children who were not given opportunities as they should have through a public education system, Currently, our area three has suffered from lack of opportunities. It has gone on for decades and it is uh, troubling to go ahead and have students who do not even have internet in their classrooms prior to COVID, that we don't have soap and water in our classrooms, but yet the district is spending $80,000 on artisan bread at the Boljarie for a select few schools. We need to go ahead and need the voice of area three residents who voice these issues, including lack of paper that would just happen last week that the board didn't know and our business manager didn't know. Thank you. Okay, next question, Michael. Um, what are your thoughts about teaching racial equity in classrooms? Give specifics on how you would approach this in elementary, middle, and high school, if there are differences. I'm a strong supporter of trying to bring in multiple diverse views into our daily curriculum of our students. Area three is predominantly three different demographics of Asian, Hispanic, and white. We could tap into technologies and bring in partnerships with teachers from other districts uh, to bring views of our curriculum, which is very, on the history side, for example, very Anglo-European. 
our own Port Chicago fire explosion from the 1940s is a prime example right here in our backyard that we don't even teach our children of the end, um, how racial issues have continued to be fought and justice for those sailors some almost 50, almost some 100 years later. It's in our backyard. It's in our community. We need to bring it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Keisha, same question. What are your thoughts about teaching racial equity in the classrooms, uh, providing specifics about how you would approach it in, in elementary, junior, and high school? I actually don't think there needs to be much difference um, between teaching racial equity between the grade levels. Um, because it should be in, instilled in, as Michael just mentioned, in every part of, of our educational curriculum, in every subject. Um, multicultural curriculum, I stand behind and strongly support, which means that we learn, we learn um, our complete history. We learn about every ethnic and racial group that's, that's impacted not only the United States, but throughout world history. Um, we should institute social justice education, social justice learning, because our children, as much as we want, might want to keep them sh shielded from what's going on in our world, um, just in my daughter's lifetime, she's great racial uprisings and other uprisings, and that should be a part of our education, as well as culturally responsive um, learning so that kids, teachers debunk any stereotypical educational myths about any one particular ethnic group. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha, um, next question. Approximately 20% of parents in District 3 have historically sought transfers for their kids away from, excuse me, for their district school. Mm -hmm. your thoughts on why this has been happening and what it should look like in the future? Mm -hmm. I think it happens um, because we have all bought in. My um, as to what a, a, a good school is. And, um, and well, just to name the app that we all look at, a great school. And I honestly think that um, while the intention, that it may not be explicit, but I think racism is a part of it. I think you look at the test or um, the percent of students who are English language learners and parents think that possibly can't be a so-called great school. And they seek to, to leave their neighborhood school. Um, I think it shouldn't be that way. I think all of our schools are great or, and have the potential for even um, bigger greatness, for lack of using, for lack of a better word. Um, and we should just do a better job of allowing schools to show off what makes them um, an excellent asset to their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michael, same question. Approximately 20% of parents in the district have historically sought transfers for their kids away from the schools in the district. Your thoughts on why this has been happening and what this should look like in the future. Thank you. As Keisha was alluding to, um, there is a perception and having, to go, having a son who's now technically in his fourth year at, um, at an elementary school, um, it, it was very hard to have his TK students uh, in his TK year, almost 25% of them leave the district. And it was mostly because of safety issues and because of lack of resources. Uh, Sequoia Middle School, uh, Sequoia Elementary, excuse me, has a waiting list of over 400 students. This tells you that the community is thirsty for knowledge. They're thirsty for resources. And when the school doesn't even grant basic safety um, needs of the children. They do not grant basic resources. Um, it is troubling. And by getting that communication going with the district from actual parents of Area 3 on the board is a must. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Michael, again, uh, what specific security me measures would you favor for, for the district schools? regarding access to the campus from dangerous intruders. How would your suggestions differ from what you see now on the district campuses? Currently, we, the city of Concord has withdrawn all the resource officers and I believe we've also done that for the surrounding cities um, in the district. 
the school system, our schools are an educational environment and we need to do a better job outside of the schools in pertaining those issues that keep coming into our schools. And so by going ahead and promoting more positive behavior intervention for our students. My own experience um, has been with, uh, even with Oak Grove Middle School, that resource officers are simply not trained in de-escalation techniques with students. It's an immediate call for backup when they could just be going ahead and just sitting down and having a counselor ask, hi, what's, what, you're not in class, what's wrong? A simple conversation starter, training is a must uh, for the safety of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Akeisha, uh, same question. What specific security measures would you favor for the district schools regarding access to the campus from dangerous intruders? How would your suggestions differ from what you see now on the district campuses? Um, I, I am a, a strong supporter of police-free schools. Um, I don't think that that protects a school from dangerous intruders because even when they are on campus, um, it's one police officer versus that dangerous intruder. But in general, school safety, um, I don't th think that school resource officers are necessary and the police shouldn't be on campus. We should invest our resources into making sure all the kids are well, all the staff are well, and that is by investing in social workers and school counselors, making sure kids and families have all that they need, have enough food, have the resources they need at home to be well and healthy um, mentally, emotionally, socially. Um, so the, the, those are the efforts that I would take to keep our schools safe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Keisha, again, what is your experience with the adult education program in the district? What would be your thoughts toward supporting or enhancing um, what it has to offer? So I don't have much, I actually, I personally have no experience with the adult education program in our district, but what I have learned is that we have everything to be proud of in our district because our district has prioritized it. Our district has kept it in the school district, hasn't moved it to the community college. Um, we provide um, English learning, I'm sorry, English language classes for parents while their children simultaneously go to preschool. We provide a path for parents to learn English and then go on to community college um, to learn, to earn a degree in early care and education. And then just as a, a, an adult here, I receive um, the great catalog that shows all of the enrichment programs that are for adults and then the health, um, the allied health programs, which can train um, folks in our community for real paying jobs and a good career. So I strongly support adult ed and I'm really proud of what our district has achieved. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Michael, uh, what is your experience with the adult education program in the district and what would be your thoughts towards supporting and or enhancing what they have to offer? The Adult Education um, Loma Vista Center is ripe for expansion um, for technology so that parents would not have to come to the school, that we could actually start looking at other ways of taking some of these teachers and these programs and bringing them into the high schools and the middle schools as separate modular uh, buildings on campus. One thing that I'm very um, excited about that's, that is in the monument is that the childcare for parents is right next to our elementary schools. By going ahead and having a modular where parents could drop off their children for childcare and be able to take a class without having to travel um, all across the, the city, um, let's start bringing those resources at the local schools and let's start bringing those sources exactly how we're doing today with Zoom and we can move forward on those programs. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Michael, again, beginning with this next question. Um, in the era of COVID-19, um, we are looking at alternatives for bringing children back into the classroom. 
outdoor learning has been proposed as an option to classroom learning. Please provide your thoughts about this alternative and what steps might be necessary to implement it. What kind of learning was, you kind of cut out a little bit there. Oh, I'm so sorry, let me repeat. Um, outdoor learning has been proposed as an option to classroom learning. Please provide your thoughts about this alternative and what steps would be necessary to implement it. We'll have to learn a little bit more about the alternative learning. If we're talking about distance learning, I do think it's an option for parents that just will not have their children return until they feel that there's a safe vaccine. Um, I do believe that we need to start bringing our K through uh, second grade students back into a classroom in small groups, similar to what parks and recreations have done in all three cities by having small cohorts. This way we minimize any um, transference of any kind of, of uh, positive that may occur. And um, it's, it's a, as a parent of a first grader, it is very difficult to have to go ahead and go through this distance learning. Uh, we need alternatives. We need other options. This one step for all does not work. It does not work in overall education and it certainly doesn't work when we're gonna have these future bad air days and future power outages at our schools. Thank you. Okay, um, Kaisha, uh, same question. Uh, in the area of COVID-19, uh, uh, we are looking at uh, how to bring children back to school uh, for either distance learning or in class. Outdoor learning has been proposed as an option to classroom learning. Please provide your thoughts about this alternative and, what's, and what steps would be necessary to implement it if you think it's a good idea. I think I, I know of um, schools across the country who have implemented outdoor learning. I think that the problem here is a month ago or more than a month ago, our state had you know, caught on fire and the air quality is awful. But even before then, I feel like just only because of our geography and where we live, that would be difficult. Um, we've had extreme temperatures this month, last month, and I'm sure into October, um, we have we would have extreme temperatures into the winter. I can't imagine having children learning and paying attention in 100 degree heat or 30 degree um, coldness. Um, so I think it's a good idea if we lived in a more mild climate. I don't think it's a good idea because of where we live and because we're on fire. Thank you. Um, hey, Sean. <clears throat> um, what are your views on how students who are testing below grade level uh, can most easily catch up? What are the responsibilities of the schools to monitor this and to publicly, publicly report on its progress? Mm -hmm. um, that's a familiar question. I think that to, um, for, for students who test below grade level, I think one, I'm assuming those testing are based on standardized tests. And that we, I personally um, believe that those tests are racist in roots and don't actually measure what a child knows. However, if it's based on a teacher's own knowledge of that student's um, um, performance in regular education activities, I think that it's the responsibility of the teacher to work with the family to figure out, to help figure out what could be the challenges, what's contributing to the challenges of that child learning. It may not be that they're not getting it. It may be that they're hungry. It may be that something's going on at home that makes um, worrying about school a real challenge. And so I think it should be done in partnership with the family to figure out how to catch that child back up. Um, reporting it, um, I guess it shows up on the dashboard. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Okay. Michael, same question. Um, what are your views on how students who are testing below grade level can most easily catch up? Additionally, what are the responsibilities of the schools to monitor this and to publicly report on its progress? I believe that when it comes to children that are struggling uh, with education, that it is 100% the district's responsibility. We are a district of two different models. In one model, if a student is having problems with reading, or learning, there are teacher aides, there are volunteers, there are paid tutors that are brought in to go ahead and 
uh, through PTA and PVC funds um, in amounts of hundreds of thousands, up to $300,000 at an elementary school. Meanwhile, our area three schools, a child is not able to, those resources are not available. This is why I have been pushing for partnerships in the city of Concord to get more resources into the classroom. Um, we have parents that are working two and three jobs. They can't volunteer and come in and be those tutors and teacher aides. The district needs to step up and provide um, these resources for our children. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Michael, you have a first shot at the next question also. Uh, the annual State of California student evaluations have been criticized as favoring students who live in an English only world uh, over those who speak and interact with another language at home. How would you respond to this point of view? I'm a Bay Area native. Most everybody speaks two languages and a majority of people, English is not the primary language. Our own uh, Silicon Valley has so many uh, HS1 visas uh, that are people from all over the world that English was not their second language. And so I, I really believe in um, bilingual, uh, that we start this early, alluding to the previ previous question of why students are leaving the uh, monument area. It's because they want a dual language. They wanna be able to get into an IB program. They want that baculate where they have the bilingual that they can go ahead and say, yes, I can go ahead and speak two languages. And I think places uh, are programs such as what's happened over um, with the language arts over at Holbrook that needs to be expanded so that we don't focus so much on English, but also we can go ahead and focus on other languages that students wish to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Kaisha, um, the same question. The annual State of California evaluations have been criticized as favoring students who live in an English only world over those who speak and interact with another language of home. How would you respond to this point of view? I would absolutely agree. Um, standardized tests uh, are only, um, benef if there is any benefit, it it absolutely does favor children who only speak English or who speak English as their first language. Um, we, as a state, decided to get rid of bilingual education two over two decades ago, 25 or so years ago. And with that, we, we forced upon ourselves an English-only way of learning and obviously English-only testing. Therefore, um, the true for whatever those standardized tests are supposed to measure, they're really only measuring how well a child um, who speaks English can do on these tests, um, not allowing a child who, for whom English is a language that they are learning and for whom their world is not primarily English speaking, um, it, it gives them no opportunity to show off their intelligence. Thank you. Um... Asia, you're up first on the next question. Uh, many students in the district are qualified as English learners when they enter the district. <laughs> What's your understanding of the goals of this program and its past record of achieving its effectiveness? And its past record of achieving its effectiveness. Um, <laughs> so um, our English learner program, like I said, we do not have bilingual education in our district or in California, it means that a child has to learn English and learn um, their basic subjects only in English. And so because we've done that, it's, it's and we've really um, sort of not supported dual language learning until recently. That's it's a very popular thing now. I mean, in, for the right reasons that we're uplifting a child's home language, we've really done a, lot, a few generations of children harm um, in 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 their own education because they didn't get to learn in their home language. So um, I know our district does the best that it can, the best that it can given the constraints that we have. 
with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, same question. The um, students are, many students in, in the district are qualified as English learners when they enter the district. What is your understanding of the goals of this program and its past record of achieving its effectiveness? This is one um, aspect that the district seems to have done some improvements over the years where uh, English learning is to get the children up to speed um, at a certain level that they become English proficient. We are an English speaking society and it is important that they get there uh, as early as possible before they're bombarded with math and social science and, uh, and science in general. Um, it, it is a little odd that with our uh, demographics that um, we don't have a STEAM program in Spanish. I do know that there's one in Santa Clara County and I've uh, talked to many people about this in the community that this could be an alternative that we um, continue with our DLAC and English learning programs to get our children up to an English proficiency stat. Um, and if it's too difficult, then we do need to bring back um, the bilateral and um, kind of just start going ahead and having our curriculum in that format. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this next question, which uh, we'll begin with you, Michael, uh, is a follow-up. At what grade do you believe students who have been classified as English learners should become officially English proficient and why? Can you elaborate as to the positives and negatives of meeting this classification? And again, I really don't like metrics. I don't like going ahead and putting a solid bar that says three years, we're gonna have this accomplished. Um, every student learns different. Every student is coming from a different background. May it be that they are extremely wealthy immigrant family coming in versus they're not wealthy and they're coming from a war torn or, um, or from an area that um, has had severe violence. We need to be patient with our English learners. Um, some of them will take time. And again, by going ahead and reaching out into the community where we have resources that can help them um, go ahead and achieve those goals, both inside the district and just outside the district with, with uh, English learning, it will eventually happen. And we should not go ahead and put a bar that says it has to be this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Geisha, uh, same question. At what grade do you believe students who have been classified as English learners should become officially English proficient and why? Additionally, can you elaborate as to the positives and negatives of meeting this classification? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have students enter our district at who aren't in, yet English proficient at every grade. So I don't one, there is not a grade level that they should become English proficient at. They should um, reach English, they should be classified as English proficient the moment they actually are English proficient. Um, we would all hope that that happens as quickly as possible because it is important um, for, their, for their education, no matter what, whether it's just getting in, I say, progress into high school or progress into college or trade school or some other um, training after high school. I um, already forgot the second half of the question, but um, I, it is very, it, become, becoming English proficient obviously is important um, because the primary language um, of our country is English, but they should not be classified as English proficient until they actually are. I think that would cheat the students um, very much. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, Aisha, you're on for this. Um, how would you deal with a $10 million deficit that the uh, well, Mount Diablo Unified School District has? Well, I would hope that voters are very smart on November 3rd and vote yes on Prop 15, um, which would bring about $19 million, um, nearly $19 million into our, into our district, which theoretically, I guess, would wipe away that $10 million deficit. But however, whether or not that happens or not, we're, I, I am, fairly confident we are going to be in deficits for a long time. And I think 
as um, that we need to lay it all on the table. We need to know, we need to find ways um, to save money, to find cost savings that least impact students. And so, and least impact, least harm um, teachers and staff who work with students. Um, so I would work, again, back to that first question or second, I would work as a team with the board, but as a team with the community and everyone involved to figure out solutions that are just the least harmful to our community. Okay, Michael, same question. How would, uh, how would you deal with the $10 million deficit that the school district has? And actually, I think it's closer to 13 to 15 million. Um, one thing we do know is by raising more money, as uh, they have done since in the last five years, they've brought in 80 million extra dollars into the coffers, and they still have not been able to balance the budget. This was on top of a $60 million surplus. So in essence, in five years, they've gone through 140 million, and we have nothing to show for our monument schools, uh, especially for area three. I would really look at district support um, at the admin level. I would uh, go ahead and I would say it needs to be modernized. And I know this because I've done it in hundreds and thousands of operations in six states that by modernizing, we can save money in the long term, reinvest that back into our teachers. And um, Prop 15 is going to be a great thing if it passes. But just like every other proposition, it's going to get tied up in courts for seven to 10 years. This is not going to be a quick solution. And we need to look at our community here and restructure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, starting with you again, Michael, new question. Uh, how do you feel about unions in the school system? Unions, um, they, they have their purpose. And I really support their, their cause of protecting their employees. And I, and I really, as we keep talking about COVID, we keep mentioning students, but teachers are right there too. And I really believe in that. I also believe though that as most unions, like police unions, it needs some reforming. It needs to come into a 21st model. It needs to start being more of a um, uh, accountable uh, type system where when we do have things that go sideways within the faculty, um, that we can offer them training and especially in diversity training and tolerance uh, to let them know that, hey, this is, this is not right. Uh, so again, having uh, unions has its purpose. And um, I definitely know that teachers do not get paid enough. And but at the same time, I also know that a lot of the problems that are happening with parents transferring it's because of tenure, and we got to get rid of that. Thank you. Um, Kaisha, same question. Um, how do you feel about union school in the school district? I fully support the um, unions in the school district, and it's more than teachers. Um, almost every role in a school district is represented um, by a union, and when they're able to have that representation, that, that, that um, will be able to come together as a collective they're able to fight for what's right for themselves and for what's right for students and what's right for the community. Um, so I fully and wholeheartedly um, support unions in the school and unions everywhere, unions outside of the school. It's, they, they are why we should be thankful for so many rights as those of us who are workers um, that we have in the workplace, whether we're unionized or not. Thank you. Um, next question, Keisha, you're first. How will your being on the school board as a trustee improve the efforts of the district to meet its various goals? Sorry, we answered that question at the beginning, I think. Oh, sorry. It's one of okay. our first questions. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm getting new questions that are coming in from the audience. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't hear it. Here, just try this next one. Um, what experience do you have with students? Uh, no. Um, what do you think the school district uh, should be doing with, with the special education program in the district? How do you think it's functioning? What could they do to make it better? I'm really pleased that I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago <coughs> to speak to members, to speak to parents um, of, 
of children with special needs. And what I was pleased to learn, while we're not perfect, um, our district, <clears throat> sorry, our district does pretty well in this area compared to other districts. Now that's in comparison, so that doesn't mean that we're meeting everyone's needs um, already, because I know that we're not, and I know that's that, yeah, I know that we're not. But I am really pleased that one, we have such a deeply engaged um, parent group that supports other parents in their journey once they figure out um, that they need an IEP, that they have an IEP or need an IEP and need extra support for their student, whether they remain in general education or are um, educated under special education. So I'm really happy to learn that and I look forward to learning more about families' needs. Okay, um, Michael, very quickly, can you uh, respond to this question? You, um, your experience with special education and what you would recommend uh, be done in District 3? As I've done comparisons of what house structures are in Contra Costa County, uh, Mount Diablo has one of the best um, special education uh, divisions out of three of the, of the uh, neighboring districts and um, however we still struggle with trying to get a, a adequate IEP done quickly we still struggle with resources we have 778 um, uh, special needs instructors aides um, in our system and we need to go ahead and continue beefing that up according to what uh, the parents needs are within the district and so uh, I look forward to learning more about how we do it here. Again, my experience has been outside the district and, um, and even with our technology plan that was just recently uh, adopted, I put in the public comments uh, at that meeting that we needed a technology plan for special needs students. Because again, just because um, there are needs doesn't mean that they should be left out and they will need a separate track. Okay, thank you. So, um, since Michael went for the issue, could you please provide your closing statement? Two minutes. Thank you. Um, a lot of folks have heard what spurred me to run for office, but in short, my daughter had a tough time over the last couple of years with racism at school. I had a tough time with the way it was handled, and now we find ourselves at this moment of time with so much momentum, we can actually achieve change. What most don't know is that I never imagined before June of this year that I'd be running for office in this very moment at all. Um, I've always known that I would run someday because I've always been an advocate for all things that are right and all things that are just. So since August, I've had the privilege of speaking with parents, with teachers, staff, and community leaders, listening <coughs> and learning about the needs and the wants <coughs> of the community that will hopefully elect me. What I found out is that our values align, our experiences are extremely familiar to each other. We want the same things for our children. And so if I'm on your ballot, I really hope I've earned, I've earned your vote. Thank you. Okay, hey, Michael, two minutes, closing statement. Thank you everyone for your time. My learning process of the needs and wants of the Area 3 community over these years is a continuous evolving process because our demographics are also changing quite significantly. What remains constant is that people outside of our neighborhood keep insisting they know what's best for our community and our schools. We have a 30 year track record that shows no, they do not. Local representation has meaning. This is the first time that we'll actually have district elections. A vision of a school board member has changed. It should be someone that you bump into at a Pete's or stand in line with at the Food Max or Trader Joe's. They should be someone you see at the 1500 Monument or spends time bridging and creating local city resources and local nonprofits into our local schools and also outside of the school. In the past five years, the district has given an additional $140 million in public money to go ahead and strengthen our programs. 
But in December of 2019, the State Board of Education red flagged MDUSD for its failures for not providing any improvements for our most vulnerable students in our monument schools for three straight years. I'm at a loss, you know, as to why the district has not been able to come up with a plan of helping our schools. Um, last year at this time, I fought hard for three months and succeeded in creating a local representation for our schools. I've been advocating for years for equity and opportunities and fairness at our schools. Together, we can take our wants and needs and we can go to the voting box and we can vote and vote for local representation as it is very important in this election. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Ms. Mzewi and Mr. Schneider who are running for trustee of the Mount Diablo Unified School District Area 3 for participating in this forum. I'd also like to thank Contra Costa Library, Contra Costa TV, and the Contra Costa Office of Elections who sponsored this presentation. For further information about candidates, issues, and voting, please refer to cocovote.us, CCCLIB.org, or votersedge.org. Voters Edge is the League of Women Voters site. All three sites have a wealth of information. And lastly, to all viewers, please be sure to vote by November 3rd. Thank you.